This is uh, the last session of this fantastic conference that I'm really happy uh, to take a very, very modest part in. Um, and uh, I think that really in the last day and a half, or two days rather, uh, we've uh, encountered so many different uh, um, kind of uh, viewpoints and, and angles of looking at this at this period, and I think it's absolutely fascinating, and I'm really, really, really happy about the about what we've had here. Uh, so we're now in the social policy, administrations, governments, and networks uh, session, and it seems to me that uh, both three papers will uh, indeed add to the uh, um, diverse uh, nature of this uh, of this conference. And our first speaker is uh, Professor Kenneth Oz. Yes. Also known as Ken. Yes. <laughs> uh, who, teaches at, uh, who teaches at the uh, uh, Department of History and Social Studies uh, Education at Buffalo State University. Uh, he's the past president of the French Colonial Historical Society. And in 2009, his book won, his book entitled uh, Religious Conflict and the Evolution of Language Policy in German and French Cameroon, 1885 to 1939, won the Hegoi Prize uh, for the best book in French colonial history. Uh, he also published um, tr numerous articles and books uh, uh, on propaganda campaigns and literary depictions of World War I uh, Africa, missionary service during the war, and church-state conflicts uh, in the French Mandate of Cameroon. His most re recent article project focuses on hunting and tourism in interwar French Cameroon and Protestant quarrels over representation uh, of the Gauls government in the lead up to the 1945-4 Brazzaville conference. So, Ken, please. I uh, was warned to give each speaker 25 minutes sharp, so I'll give you a five minutes uh, um, warning, uh, and hopefully we'll have enough time for Q&A, please. Well, like everyone else, I'd like to say a quick thank you to the organizers and to the Academy for inviting me to participate. <clears throat> this has been a wonderful experience all around. So my paper is entitled Mirror Images, a Comparative View of Social Policy in Cameroon and Palestine under Mandate. Now, by rights, British and French social policy in the respective mandates should have been quite different. Um, the French were determined to prove their worthiness of a mandate by outdoing all other colonial powers in terms of economic development and in social engineering. And in Cameroon, they found much that they felt needed fixing. And of course, the A and the B mandates were predicated on the idea that there were qualitative differences in the local people's levels of civilization and their readiness for eventual home rule. And since one measure of civilization invoked by all the colonial powers was the status of women, one would expect that the French would have been much more interventionist in Cameroon than the British were in Palestine in terms of revising things like family structure, marital law, women's education, and employment opportunities. And while that's all true on paper, the reality is that both powers were largely indifferent to the plight of indigenous women and did very little to improve their lot in life until goaded into doing so by either international or local forces. And even then, more often than not, the decisions that they made uh, ended up harming women by infantilizing them, denying them agency, and rendering them more dependent on men. And you can see this issue uh, at, at play in a number of different uh, ways. The decision, for example, to uh, alter employment prospects, the uh, 1929 uh, midwives ordinance in Palestine, for example. Um, but I'm going to focus my paper today on marriage reform. Um, I had grandiose ideas of covering more things, and then I realized in the interest of time, I needed to focus a little bit more narrowly. So I'm going to start out talking about Palestine. We'll do Cameroon later on. Um, and the issue of marital reform was clearly not a high priority for the mandatory regime in British Palestine. And I need to note that this section of the paper is drawn entirely from the works of other scholars. I don't work on Palestine myself. So this would be Elizabeth Brownson, Tammy Razi, Elise Young, and Naomi Shepard. Uh, all of whom point out that the British were much more focused on security matters and trying to exert control over local peoples than they were on anything else, because they were, of course, acutely aware of the rising tensions between uh, the Zionist immigrants and, and, of course, the local Palestinian population. Um, they also note that the British were fundamentally cheap. And they didn't like spending money on social policy. It's certainly not social reform. And more importantly, they didn't think they had to. 
because before, shortly before the British took over in Palestine, the Ottoman government had issued in December of 1917 a set of legal reforms which essentially improved the, the status of women. <clears throat> and the British decided to make very few changes in that Ottoman law, precisely because the fact that there was such a law meant that they could basically ignore many of these issues. Um, and they could shut responsibility for the issues in question onto the Palestinian Muslim com uh, community, all while pretending that it was in the interest of local autonomy and granting people religious freedom. So we need to talk a little bit about what the Ottoman family law tried to do and then what the British neglected to, to change in it. Um, so the Ottoman law on family rights, or the OLFR, was passed, as I said, in January of 1917, and it was designed to impose a degree of uniformity uh, on religious practices of various subject peoples. And when the issue of marriage practices amongst Palestinian Muslims came up, the OFLR basically retained longstanding patriarchal structures, but, but did have some improvements in women's status. So by tradition, um, the uh, marriages involved, of course, a contractual arrangement in which a, a bridegroom would negotiate a gift, a dower, that he would pay to his wife's family. Um, and the combination of a desire to bind families together, keep property within the extended family, and of course keep these dower payments low, meant that for a lot of rural Palestinian families, they tended to act very quickly. They were terrified that a, a better suitor would swoop in and, and uh, uh, marry away one of their marriage prospects, and so they tended to marry children off young. Even though the marriages themselves were not consummated, they were essentially paper constructs. Um, but the age of marriage, by some de according to some sources, could have been as early as nine for girls and 12 for for boys. Um, Brownson in particular notes that you always have to take that with a grain of salt because people were always fuzzy on dates in, in the first place. They didn't always record their marriages until much later. And some of the data, of course, is being reported by the British and everyone lied to them because they were hated. <clears throat> In any case, the OLFR tried to change all of this by doing things like banning forced marriage, by setting an age of consent without a judge's permission at 17 for girls, 18 for boys. And while judges could, could grant a uh, special dispensation to marry earlier, there was a hard line. One could not marry before the age of 15. And to sort of police that, the OLFR insisted that, that marriages be registered with the courts and also decreed that consummation had to be delayed until after puberty. Uh, and there was a, a parallel revision in the Ottoman legal code that basically uh, created jail terms of up to three to six months for anyone who violated these terms. And there were other things that the OLFR did. It regulated aspects of polygamy and, and marital living arrangements, um, and in theory gave women a degree of financial security. Um, under the law, for example, the women could add a clause to their marriage contracts stipulating that men could not take on additional wives without their permission. There were, uh, and, and that, was, that was the only stipulation that was specifically laid out, but it didn't preclude the possibility of other stipulations being worked in. So there were other examples that cropped up where women said, I, you know, that I, I, um, uh, the husband would have to care for any prior children that she brought into the marriage, or that she'd not be uh, forced to perform physical labor and things like that. So there were a lot of sort of progressive elements to that. Um, and, and lastly, the OLFR provided women with an opportunity to sue husbands in court for a failure to pay maintenance payments, right? So it, it denied uh, uh, husbands the ability to use essentially financial uh, uh, um, means as a, as a form of social control. Now, when the British took over in Palestine in December 1917, they began all kinds of changes to the Ottoman legal system to anglicize it, frankly, to make it easier for themselves to deal with it. This was all done in, in the, uh, in, in, out of a desire to improve efficiency and to standardize things uh, in accordance with sort of English legal customs. But when it came to addressing family law, their changes were incremental at best and showed a distinct lack of interest. It takes them fully two years to come up with any laws whatsoever uh, that dealt with marriage reform. And, and even then, it was only to pass what was called the marriage family, the, sorry, the Muslim family law. And all that that did was it rescinded the parts of the OFLR that dealt with, with Muslims, sorry, with, um, with Christians, rather, and with Jews. It, it left intact the things uh, that, that uh, governed Palestinian marriage practices. And, and rather than enforce the law, that was sort of the, the OFLR that had been only slightly tinkered with, um, the British put the newly created Supreme Muslim Council in charge of adjudicating it. And uh, essentially, the, 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 Palestinian, sorry, the, the Mandate Administration in Palestine washed its hands of the matter altogether to focus on what it regarded as more pressing issues, like immigration and land sales and labor policy and security matters. And, and it did so, of course, all while claiming that it was upholding the spirit and letter of the mandate by allowing pa Palestinians to exercise autonomy over religious matters. 
And the interesting thing is, is that given that the, um, that the OLFR had essentially curtailed elements of traditional Palestinian Muslim marital practices, certainly in the, in the rural areas, you could expect that the Muslim community would take Britain's sort of disinterest in this as an opportunity to ignore the law altogether and to do basically whatever they wanted and, and above all to continue with past practices. But in reality, it's very different. Over the next 15 years, Palestinian leaders actually began adding sort of their own de facto marital reforms. There are reports that as early as 1923, Muslim judges all over the mandate were refusing to register marriages where they were, where they were worried that the bride might be underage. Um, the SMC issued a pamphlet attacking the issue of, of dower payments, saying that it encouraged people to seek out young brides, um, and, 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 it, and that, that it put all the, the emphasis on the wrong things. Uh, instead, the pamphlet said that really a bride's education level and social development were far more valuable than her age or any money she might bring into the marriage. And meanwhile, you had things like the Islamic Girls' School in Jerusalem that was working to delay marriages by offering to let girls stay on in school, even if they'd already co completed the curriculum. The net effect of these measures that was, that, was that in 1936, the SMC proposed actually amending the law to raise the age of consent to 18 for both men and women. So a rather progressive measure. Meanwhile, after years of neglect, the British were finally forced to take up the issue of marital reform, but by forces from beyond the mandate. Because at home in the metropole, <clears throat> the British member of parliament, Eleanor Rathbone, and others had spent years campaigning to raise the age of consent, first in Britain, but also in other parts of the empire. And that led to a flurry of activity throughout the late 1920s, which increased the age of consent to, in, to 14 in India and to 16 in Britain, Egypt, and Transjordan. Now, starting in the early 1930s, Rathbone shifted her attention and began focusing on Palestine. And at roughly the same time that she began asking questions about uh, what marital practices were in Palestine, the League of Nations Permanent Mandates Commission, or the PMC, began taking up the issue of child marriage as well and demanded that all of the mandatory powers issue reports on its prevalence in their mandates and any measures that they had undertaken to combat it, which put the British in an awkward position because they had taken none. <clears throat> and this forced the British in Palestine to reluctantly take up the issue, and they did so not by revising civil code, but by revising the criminal code. Um, they decided to outlaw bigamy unless it had been expressly authorized by local custom. Um, and in particular, they talked about making marriage of underage girls a criminal offense. And the key question that they, that they tripped themselves up on was the, where to set the age of consent. The British initially talked about making it 13 for girls but quickly realized that that was a non-starter, given Rathbone made it very clear she wouldn't tolerate that. The PMC was equally unhappy. Uh, Britain, of course, had just passed its own uh, Age of Marriage Act, which had set it at 16. And of course, the SMC had already proposed making it 18, so you can't go lower. Um, and in the end, the 1936 revision to the criminal code uh, set the age of consent at 15. And the British lied, basically. They, they justified this by claiming that they were making concessions to the local Muslim community, whom they depicted as reactionary and backwards. And as proof, of course, they trotted out letters written by colonial officials and travelers who had all talked about uh, the, um, the residents of the Middle East as sort of ignorant and backwards and uncivilized. And they pointed also to the SMC's opposition to the marital clause in the criminal code, saying that this was essentially proof that Palestinian women remained in need of British protection from their own culture. But in reality, as Brownson and the other scholars that work, whose work I'm relying on uh, show, the SMC was actually far more progressive than the British were and, and were only opposing the, the marital uh, uh, clause in the new criminal code because it was one of the few things over which they had autonomy and the British were basically treading all over it without asking them their opinion. Um, and, and more importantly, she, the, the scholars also note that the, even, even though the British did put through this change in the criminal code, they never enforced it. They made no effort whatsoever to try to police these issues, showing fundamentally that they were disinterested in the issue of women's rights altogether. Um, and in fact, that level of disinterest, along with parallel changes in, in uh, law that precluded women from holding certain kinds of jobs, not just in midwifery, but also in, in, in sort of industry, all of these things ultimately hurt women by taking away agency and in the end making them far more dependent on husbands for material support and social standing. And at this point, I want to turn and shift our attention to Cameroon, where, as it turns out, things are remarkably similar, although there'll be a sort of a surface difference. So when the French took control of Cameroon in 1914, they faced a long-standing social system which accepted polygamy, technically polygamy, um, a system which also required that bridegrooms pay a bride price or a dowry to male guardians in order to secure a wife. There was an acceptance of child marriage, 
And there was a requirement that widows remarry a member of their dead husband's family in order to keep family property intact. Now, in general, French administrators from the beginning found the idea of child marriage distasteful. They agreed that polygamy and, child, and the bride price system robbed women of free will and created the appearance, if not the reality, that women were essentially being bought and sold into slavery. And they talked about how this created demographic impacts by making it very difficult for young men to marry. Having said all of that, the French were very reluctant to address the issue of marital reform because they were worried about causing resentment amongst Africans by intruding into longstanding social custom. Uh, basically, the French were worried that doing so would trigger strikes, boycotts, demonstrations, all of which would not only impact their economic development plans, but more importantly, would make them look bad. And they were, this sort of uh, brings up another issue that was raised yesterday. They were terrified, frankly, of international public opinion um, and how, how events in the mandate would make them appear because they were trying to make the case that they deserved the mandate precisely because they were better than all the other colonial powers, an argument that couldn't be made if, if you know, these sorts of things that they were worried about, these demonstrations, would eventually take place. Now, when the French did finally begin passing laws to regulate marriage practice in Cameroon. It was in, the, it was in the 1920s, but one of the consistent themes is they never have the money, the people, or the will to enforce any of the laws. So they're basically engaging in wallpapering, right? They're putting up some, some things on paper that they have no intent of actually uh, sort of living up to. And in the end, it means that their, their efforts to, to, to try to improve women's status in the mandate were no more effective than those of their British counterparts in Palestine. So for the French, it starts in December of 1922. The, the governor there, uh, Jules Cald, issues a, a law granting women the right to divorce and technically requiring the consent of both partners for a marriage to be legal. And in that same year, he basically issues a circular saying, we, we clearly need much more uh, far-reaching laws that govern all aspects of, of marital reform, but that's not something that I'm going to deal with because my time is limited and he gets rotated out and sent on to another post. Um, instead, crafting those laws fell to his successor, Theodore Parmarchand, who was far more interested in matters of labor reform. Um, and, well, not so much labor reform. Again, there's a lot of window dressing there. It's uh, labor exploitation. Um, he's much more interested in raising taxes. It's very much an economic argument uh, or, or focus that his administration has. Nevertheless, over the first few years of his tenure, so we're talking now in the late 1920s, Marchand does issue a series of new decrees which officially denounced the dowry system and polygamy, saying that they were contrary to women's rights. And the new laws theoretically limited things like um, the bride price amount. There was a, a hard ceiling beyond which one could not go. Uh, it set the minimum age of consent at 14 for girls, 16 for boys, and expanded some of the grounds on with, under which women could secure a divorce. Uh, he also addressed the issue of wife inheritance by allowing widows to retain their freedom, but only if they repaid the bride, the bride price that had been say, set for them when they initially got married. And all of these were to be reinforced by the creation of a civil registry system. So the, you'd have to register your, your marriage with the French authorities. Um, and that would allow you to not only, the French rather, to not only record marriages, but they could then impose fines uh, and jail time, as well as confiscate dowries for any violations of the law. And, and at first glance, all of this appears pretty progressive, right? The French seem like they're actually doing something. But again, there's no effort and no means whatsoever in the mandate of enforcing any of this. Cameroonian administration was very small, and those administrators that were present, again, were more fixated on um, the campaign to root out any vestiges of the German presence, to collect taxes, to promote economic development. There was no interest or focus uh, on the issue of women. Certainly, they didn't have the time uh, to, or, or the ability to do a census, for example, to find out if people were complying with the law. And more importantly, they didn't want to damage relations with polygamous local elites with whom they had to do business. Um, as they're building these large railroad projects, for example, they needed to get the local chieftains to help uh, secure labor for that. Um, and, and you couldn't, uh, the French decided they couldn't afford to alienate those chieftains. And of course, as for the Cameroonians, most of them still lived in rural areas, uh, did not speak French, and of course couldn't read uh, in French what the law said, and were blissfully ignorant that the laws had been changed at, in, in any way. And as a result, of course, they continued with traditional marital practices, including things like um, negotiations and payments of bride price, sanctioning child marriage, and all of the other things that Marchand had supposedly changed. And the mandatory administration's lack of effort to police any of this, to do anything further, caused it to run afoul of one of the missionary societies, particularly the Catholic Spiritan Mission, which had its own private campaign to pressure converts to adopt monogamy 
and to rein in dowry payment systems. And it, they did so through a series of vocal denunciations initially inside Cameroon itself. Um, they also put pressure on, on their converts by denying them religious and other services. And, and this is the one that gets them uh, in perhaps the most hot water with the administration, they start offering up positions in their schools and in their mission stations as refuges for women who were trying to flee marriages that they didn't want to be in for whatever reason. Um, there's also some talk on the part of the Spiritans to pressure the French colonial authorities into combating polygamy by imposing a tax based on the number of wives that one had or simply outlawing it outright. And the Marchand administration quickly said, well, we're not going to tax them, and we're certainly not going to ban polygamy because that's going to create other problems for, for us. But the mission goaded the administration, the Marchand administration, into making a couple of new tweaks to the law in the summer of 1930. And, and these measures were, I think, partly in response to, A, the growing number of complaints from the mission, but also, as it turns out, complaints from Cameroonian men who were most upset, not that the government was interfering in their lives, because the government really wasn't, but because the mission was. Um, there were complaints that too many wives were fleeing to the mission schools or to mission stations, um, and that this was disrupting not only their family life, but also making it difficult for them to uh, provide enough labor on their farms, and they therefore could not meet the cash crop quotas that were being set by the French administration. And so to combat this, Marchand comes up with a couple of new ideas. First off, he ordered that Christian women fleeing polygamous Muslim marriages had to immediately pay, repay the entirety of their bride price in order to not be reassigned to another family member. That was a, a slight difference in the, pa in the earlier law. They were given time. Now it's going to be an immediate payment if you leave the marriage. Um, there's also talk about expanding the civil registry and, more importantly, requiring that one come to a, mission sta sorry, to a government station first and have a civil ceremony before any other kind of ceremony could take place. And I think partly this was designed to you know, uh, strike back at the missions. You know, you're, you're criticizing us, so we're going to curtail some of your activities. I think it was also designed to keep better tabs on the Cameroonian population and perhaps to police the, uh, the issue of, br of bride price payments. Uh, but the effect of this is much more far-reaching than they intended. Again, most Cameroonians lived far too, uh, too far away, ultimately, from, mission, fr from government stations and therefore decided to not bother registering civil marriages at all. Um, that's assuming, of course, that they even knew that the law had been changed to make that a requirement. And in so doing, the fact that they are no longer registering their marriages with any kind of authority, it meant that wives no longer had any sort of legal protections. Instead, they occupied a gray zone in which they could be abandoned by their husbands at will. They had no, no ability to sue for maintenance, um, could not uh, use the law to protect them from mistreatment, and above all, couldn't avail themselves of divorce law to leave relationships that clearly no longer worked for them. And the spirit and reaction to all of this is, again, howls of outrage. And they then decided to up the ante. They launched a vocal campaign, this time in the metropolitan press, accusing the Marchand administration of ignoring women and, more importantly, of damaging France's international reputation by not living up to the spirit of the mandate by improving social conditions. Um, they talked constantly about how the, the existence of the dowry system was a form of slavery, which, of course, as, as a, a, a sort of a modern mandatory power, you were already pledged to, to abolish. Um, they talked about uh, the need for meaningful reform. They specifically pointed out, too, that this was having a demographic impact, because what was happening was that only rich old men could afford to get married, and they were too old to have many children, and that this was going to impact the mandate uh, uh, down the road. There was also discussion about how, because young men couldn't get married, they were turning to prostitutes, which in turn was leading not only to a general atmosphere of debauchery, but spreading venereal disease, again making the, uh, the mandate look bad. All of this collectively prompted the colonial ministry and the PMC to launch their own investigations of what was going on and above all of the mission's complaints. And while both ventures ultimately concluded that the Spiritans had vastly overstated their case, the French decided that they needed to take some action. They, they recall Marchand to Paris in 1932 and they replace him with, uh, with, Paul Bonne, sorry, with Auguste Bonnecarrère as the new governor. And he's a far more conciliatory figure, but still drags his feet on the issue of marriage reform. He, there were other complaints that the mission had over things like labor policy and land and things like that. He dealt with those issues first. And it allowed the missions to continue harping on the fact that the government wasn't doing enough. And they actually document quite well a number of cases in which government officials completely turned a blind eye to marriages that took place with underage brides, to the fact that there was uh, you know, uh, dowry payments being made in excess of what the law allowed. 
Um, and Bonacarrera eventually recognizes that the law is riddled with loopholes. In 1933, he says, yeah, we've got to fix this. He makes a point of polling only his staff, doesn't ask anyone else, none of the missionaries, certainly none of the Cameroonians what should be done, and then creates again a series of paper reforms in which he expands things like divorce law, uh, makes it uh, important, makes it a, a requirement that marriages be registered with village elders before they could take place. Uh, he, there, there's new powers granted to the French court system to uh, police marriage and to give women additional rights, but they're not actually extending the laws out into the villages um, by opening up courts. They're not making uh, outreach efforts. They're not publicizing these things to the Cameroonian population. So again, it's, it's much ado about nothing. It's all a paper process without any real effect on the indigenous peoples. And, and that remains the case for the remainder of the interwar period. So in conclusion, because I'm nearly out of time altogether, uh, I guess the big question is, you know, what, what do we get from this comparison? And, and for me, despite the assumption that indigenous peoples in, respect of ma in their respective mandates had reached different levels of civilization and should ultimately be dealt with according, uh, accordingly, when it came to matters of social policy, the British and the French share a common indifference to the plight of indigenous peoples, particularly over the issue of marriage reform. And again, when they did act uh, to, to, to reform marital practices, it was usually because their hand had been forced. They were afraid that they were on the verge of looking bad, and so they have to do something, and they try to do the bare minimum. Um, and, and the minimum that they achieved, far from improving the lives of women, uh, in many cases actually hurt them by, by taking away you know, rights and privileges and protections that they already had and, and uh, making, made them more dependent ultimately on men. And, and in this, I think the British and the French produce, you know, very clear mirror images of one another and, uh, and their attitudes towards uh, the ideals of the mandate system and the plight of the indigenous peoples. So thank you, and I will end it there.